So we are in 2 Chronicles chapter 10. The end of chapter 9, we saw Solomon's end. You know, uh, how he had rested with his fathers, how he's buried in Jerusalem. And his son, Rehoboam, took up the throne, began to reign in his place. You know, Solomon had such a wonderful start. God was with him. He was with God. And they did, you know, his heart was tender towards God, wide open to the ways of the Lord early. But the older he grew, the harder he grew. The, the, he grew away from the Lord. And so that's, that's dev devastating. It says in Deuteronomy chapter 17, you shall surely set a king over you whom the Lord your God chooses. One from among your brethren you shall set as king over you. You may not set a foreigner over you who is not your brother. He shall not multiply horses. And we know what Solomon did with that for himself. Nor cause the people to return to Egypt, you know. For the Lord has said to you, you shall not return that way again. Neither shall he multiply wives. And we know Solomon kind of blew it there. And least his heart turn him away, you know. And that's exactly what happened with Solomon, you know. He had all of these foreign wives and their other gods drew him after them. Nor shall he multiply silver and gold. And we know at the end of Solomon's life, silver was accounted for nothing because gold was everywhere, you know. Sadly, Solomon's reign reminds me of Samson. Such a, a, an almighty godly call on a man's life. But one by one, they break all of the little rules, all of the little things that God has set up in their life to set them apart and slowly just turn away from God's word. But they still have the apparent blessings. Neither of them had an idea that God had left them till right at the end, you know. I hear it all the time, you know. I, I talk with people and they go, Whoa, shoot, you know, I, I know it's been a while since I've been to church, but I've been shacked up with my girlfriend and we're, we're out on the party scene and, and, and the business is just going gangbusters. And we've never had it so good, you know. God's still blessing me. And sadly, they don't understand that they are simply running out of time. God is giving them time to return, to repent, to remember, you know, to come back. So Solomon, you know, his son, Rehoboam, living in the palace with him, with all his foreign wives, with watching everything that goes on. You know, he's building the temples. He's, he's building the temples for the other gods. He's, he's raising up high places for them. And yet he's doing so well, he's unaware that he's actually in sin and, and wandered away from God. And it was the wrong lesson for poor Rehoboam to learn because you are going to reap what you sow. It's going to come up. It's going to come up later. And it's going to come up more abundantly than what you're planting. So Rehoboam, chapter 10, verse 1. Then Rehoboam sent to she or went to Shechem, for all of Israel had gone to Shechem to make him king. You know, Shechem, it was the center of Ephraim and Manasseh in the northern kingdom. It has this wonderful history in it. Abraham had gone to Shechem. Jacob had gone there. Joshua took the, all of the tribes there, and that's where they pronounced the blessings and the cursings upon the godly and the ungodly. You know, it's a place of covenant. And it always makes me wonder, does Rehoboam sense that there is friction between the northern ten tribes and the southern two tribes? Does he know that? It says in verse 2, So it happened when Jeroboam, the son of Nebat, heard it, he was in Egypt where he had fled from the presence of King Solomon, that Jeroboam reigned in, Jer in Egypt, that Jeroboam <laughs> returned from Egypt, then they sent for him and called him, and Jeroboam and all Israel came and spoke to Rehoboam, saying, you got these Boams, guys. You got the Jeroboam and the Rehoboam. Don't get them mixed up. Here's the deal. You got a brand new king coming on the scene, Rehoboam. And 
there's no issue for Judah in the southern kingdom. They are more than willing to accept Rehoboam as their new king. But the northern ten tribes bring in Jeroboam. It, you, maybe you remember it when we went through 1 Kings, but it says, now it happened at that time, 1 Kings eleven twenty nine, when Jeroboam went out of Jerusalem that the prophet Ahijah, the Shilonite, went, met with him on the way, and he had clothed himself with a new garment. And the two were alone in the field, and Ahijah took the, off the new garment that was on him, and tore it into 12 pieces. And he said to Jeroboam, take for yourself 10 pieces, for thus says the Lord God of Israel, behold, I will tear the kingdom out of the hand of Solomon and will give 10 tribes to you. Why? Because they have forsaken me and worshiped Ashtoreth and Chemosh and Milcom and, and all of these other gods of the of the people that still remained in that place. And they have not walked according to the ways of David. They have not kept my statutes or my judgments. However, I will not take away the whole kingdom because they are, it's the kingdom of David. But then God makes um, Jeroboam this amazing promise. He says, if you will walk with me, if you will obey my covenants and my statues and you will be my guy in that northern kingdom, he says, I will turn that kingdom and you and I will make it just like David's kingdom. I will so bless you, you will become the new king. You know, you will be the man. Solomon apparently hears about that exchange between him and God and Solomon chases him out of the kingdom chases him all the way down to Egypt and he's been down in Egypt for years waiting for Solomon to die and finally when Solomon dies he begins to head back and it seems like the northern ten tribes send some people to go find him and bring him back and they come to this meeting and they're not just coming to make Rehoboam king, they're coming with some requests. We would like this, you know? Says in verse three, then they sent for him and called him and Jeroboam and all Israel came and spoke to Rehoboam saying, your father made our yoke heavy. Now therefore lighten the burden, some service which your father and his heavy yoke, which he put on us, and we will serve you. So he said to them, come back to me after three days. And the people departed. So good so far. Your dad, Solomon. Man, he laid this heavy load upon the northern ten tribes. Man, you got to supply my table. You got to bring this. You got to do that. Hey, I want that young man in my troop. You know, all of that stuff. And they're saying, man, if you just lighten up a bit. If you just... Give us a little breathing room. We'll be right there with you. When someone comes griping to you, many times there's something in that gripe. There's some seed of truth, you know. And it's good advice to listen, to think through it, you know. We should all have a three-day rule like this, you know. Give me three days. Give me three days, let me go think about this, pray about this, seek the Lord about this. Let me gather some advice, you know, I'll, I'll meet you back here. Verse six, then King Rehoboam consulted the elders who stood before his father, Solomon, while he was still living, saying, how do you advise me to answer the people? And they spoke to him saying, if you are kind to these people and please them and speak good words to them, they will be your servants forever. I understand this. Rehoboam is a 41-year-old man. He goes to Solomon, his dad's counselors, these old wise guys. They were counseling the wisest king in the world. You got to think about that. They're probably got a little wisdom. You know, they've probably been around the horn a couple of times. They, they know what they're doing. So he goes to these wise guys and, and they say, Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall, you know, find peace. Or a soft answer turns away wrath. What they do is they give him biblical advice. 
Man, if you sweet talk these guys, they'll be yours. No, no big deal. Jesus says, if you want to lead, then become the servant of all. Figure out how to serve these people. They'll, they'll follow you as a leader. So verse 8, but he rejects the advice which the elders had given him and consults the young men who had grown up with him who stood before him. He rejects the old wisdom. That generation has no idea what it's talking about. And he goes to the kids that grew up with him in the palace. All the who's who's kids. They were brought up with these silver spoons in their mouths, you know. They were the palace brats. They have no idea what it was to live out in reality. <laughs> They've never had to struggle for a job, you know. Dad bought them everything. Never had to work or earn or strive because daddy is a somebody. And all you got to do is ask and it gets done. So verse 9, And he said to them, What advice do you give? How should we answer the people who have spoken to me, saying, Lighten the yoke which your father has put on us? Then the young man who had grown up with him spoke to him, saying, Thus you should speak to the people who have spoken to you, saying, Your father has made our yoke heavy, but you make it lighter on us. Thus you shall say to them, My little finger shall be thicker than my father's waist. And now, whereas my father put a heavy yoke on you, I will add to your yoke. My father chastised you with whips, but I will chastise you with scourges or scorpions, those, those cats of nine tails with the, with the metal shavings and the, you know, the seashells in them, the, the stuff that would rip you apart. You think you had it bad when my father reigned and ruled over you. You haven't seen anything yet, right? This is perhaps the worst answer and the worst advice ever given. <laughs> Especially for someone wanting to unite a kingdom to become their king, you know. It's a, it's a nation of 12 families. And you're trying to hold this family together. You guys know how family squabbles go, you know? You're trying to hold the family together. Oh, you haven't seen nothing yet. You wait till I show up. You'll get yours, you know? Just lighten up a bit. No way. You ain't seen nothing yet. So Jeroboam and all the people came to Rehoboam on the third day as the king had directed, saying, come back to me on the third day. Then the king answered them roughly. King Rehoboam rejected the advice of the elders, and he spoke to them according to the advice of the young men, saying, my father made your yoke heavy, but I will add to it. My father, my father chastised you with whips, but I will chastise you with scorpions. So the king did not listen to the people. For the turn of events was from God, that the Lord might fulfill his word, which he had spoken by the hand of Ahijah the Shilonite to Jeroboam the son of Nebat. I love that. So, so he rejects this great and sound advice of the elders and takes, you know, his peers' advice. And he speaks roughly to these ten tribes. He has no tact. He's not seeking peace. He's not looking for some agreement. And what's interesting is it says this is all the Lord's doing. Bringing about the prophecy of Ahijah. So this is God's sovereignty and man's responsibility in the same sentence. <laughs> All working together here. God saw all of this coming. He told the people it was going to come. And then he lets it play out through human hands, human choices. God knows the end from the beginning. And he is still gracious to us. Isn't that amazing? He knows you're going to blow it. And he still loves you. And he still chose you. He still called you. And yet, yet he knows you. I, I love that. He, 
he shares his love with us. He forgives us, knowing that we are fools, knowing that he got a lemon that day, you know? There is nothing you have ever done that has surprised him. And that surprises me sometimes, because I get surprised, you know? I'm like, oh, I can't believe I did that. I don't know why you can't believe you did that, you know? But he knew what he was getting that day. What a relief that is for a guy like me. And it kind of just let, okay, I can breathe. Because he knew he was getting me, this half brain guy, you know. He knows I ain't the sharpest stick in the book, you know, or in the, in the forest. On the cross that day, he bore all of your sins, past, present, and future. You, you don't think he knows how you're going to blow it next week? Maybe next month? And yet he's not afraid to call you his son or his daughter or his brother. You know? So verse 16, Now when all Israel saw that the king did not listen to them, the people answered the king, saying, What share have we in David? We have no inheritance in the son of Jesse. Every man to your tents, O Israel. Now see to your own house, O David. So all Israel departed to their tents. Where do you take advice? Where do you gather your advice from? You know, do you have those little handful of people that you run to and you ask? You know, you need to make sure it's godly counsel. People of the book, you know, people, biblical people giving you advice, leading you, people who are readers and studiers and prayers. Make you sure your counsel is from the Word of God that lives and abides forever. You know, that's where wisdom is. Because Rehoboam is rapidly going to discover the power of his tongue. <laughs> right? He spoke this thing out there, and boom, ten tribes just disappear over the hill. It's like, ooh, ooh, that was interesting, you know? He just ripped the kingdom apart. Here's this kingdom that God took all of this time to bring together and put David over it and Solomon over it. And here comes Rehoboam when they're about to anoint him king over the whole land. So how long has he been in office? A month, two? You know, what's it been? And suddenly, 10 of your tribes leave. Verse 17. But Rehoboam reigned over the children of Israel who dwelt in the cities of Judah. The north had seceded from the union, you know, but the two southern tribes are Rehoboam's tribes, and he reigns and rules over them, you know. Solomon would write this in, in Proverbs 13.10. By pride comes nothing but strife. In the Hebrew, it's a little more classic than that. Contention comes only by pride. When you get in a little scuffle with somebody, somebody's standing there prideful. <laughs> and it's probably the person in your shoes. You know, maybe not, but it's probably the one in your shoes, you know. Rehoboam and these young counselors of his are so arrogant and so full of themselves. Oh, you're the king. You can do whatever you want. Hmm. Verse 18, Then King Rehoboam sent Hadaram, who was in charge of the revenue. Now think about this. You've just had this big falling out, right? These ten tribes go marching off. You've insulted them. How are you going to make up for it? I got an idea. Let's send the IRS over. He's the tax guy. But the children of Israel stoned him with stones, and he died. Therefore, King Rehoboam mounted his chariot in haste to flee to Jerusalem. Is he still up north where they were about to anoint him king? And he still sends the tax guy out, and he hears word, and they stoned him. He came to the first town, and they just wiped him out. And he's like, I better get home, you know? Mounts up his chariot, heads for Jerusalem. So Israel has been in rebellion against the house of David to this day. You ever hear about the ten lost tribes of Israel? There's no lost tribes of Israel. They're right here. 
We're going to read about them all the way through. They're not lost. The reason they're lost is they've left God's king. They've left God's place. And, and we're going to read about that here in the next chapter. So, choose your counselors wisely, right? Don't use Google as your counselor. Maybe not characters on TV. You know, when you sit there and watch TV, you're listening to their counsel over and over and over, and it affects you. Don't tell me it doesn't affect you, you know? Don't find your counsel on Facebook. Oh, please don't find your Facebook, you know? Internet counseling, you know? We hear it all the time. We're listening. What are you listening to? What are you watching? What are you reading? What is influencing you? How do you make those tough decisions? Man, I pray you've got some face-to-face -face guys that you can get in their face and look in their eyes and hear their voice and go, man, I am in this pickle. I am in this situation. Where do you see? What do you see going on? How can I be, you know? What music are you listening to? What books are you reading, you know? You need real people. And then you need to filter everything through the Word of God, right? Chapter 11. Now, when Rehoboam came to Jerusalem, he assembled from the house of Judah and Benjamin 180,000 chosen men who were warriors to fight against Israel that he might restore the kingdom to Rehoboam. They've abandoned us. They've killed our tax man. Let's go kill them, guys. What? You know, I've met some people like this. They make all the wrong moves and then they think the other guys are at fault and so they want to go kill them. You know, they get their posse together and off they go. They want to go do this. Wouldn't it just be wiser to call up Jeroboam on the phone and say, hey, Jeroboam, we, we kind of got off to a rocky start. I, I made a stupid choice there. You know, I got some bad counsel and, and just could we meet face to face? Will you please forgive me? And can we start at scratch? How much easier would that be? You know, I, I'm new at this being in charge thing. I, I didn't have a lot of book learning and I didn't get a lot from dad and, and I just need to learn how this stuff works. So walk me through it. But this new king doesn't pray. He doesn't seek the Lord. He doesn't seek a priest. He doesn't go to the prophet. He doesn't look for right counsel anywhere. He goes looking for a fight. Verse 2, But the word of the Lord came to Shemaiah, the man of God, saying, Speak to Rehoboam, the son of Solomon, king of Judah, and to all Israel in Judah and Benjamin, saying, Thus says the Lord, You shall not go up and fight against your brethren. Let every man return to his house, for this thing is from me. Therefore they obeyed the words of the Lord and turned back from attacking Jeroboam. Isn't it funny? The prophet has to come to him. He doesn't go to the prophet. The Lord has to go to him. He doesn't come to the Lord. That's the wrong direction for a guy in charge of God's kingdom. <laughs> God basically says, you're not going to war against your own family, your brethren. Not going to happen. So what he, what he does now in, in verses 5 through about 12 is he begins to fortify the main strategic cities in Judah. He, he fortifies, we're told, 15 cities here. 13 of them, 12 of them, are to the south. Only three of them are to the north towards where Jeroboam is because Rehoboam knows his major um, threat is Shishak down in Egypt. Um, so that's what he does. He says in verse 5, So Rehoboam dwelt in Jerusalem and built cities in defense of Judea, Judah, and he built Bethlehem. Now, now here's the thing. 
He built up. He strengthened. He fought it. We know he didn't build Bethlehem, but he reinforced it. Etham and Tekoya, Bethzer and Sukkoth and Ad Adulam and Gath and Morsheth and Ziph. I love names in the Bible, don't you? It's like, man, they just roll off my tongue. Not much rolls off my tongue. Zora and Agilon and Hebron, which are in Judah and Benjamin, fortified cities. And he fortified the strongholds and put captains in them and stores of food and oil and wine. And also in every city he put shields and spears and he made them very strong, having Judah and Benjamin on his side. So he makes these places you know, fortified, heavily fortified, and there's food stores, and there's, you know, weapons, and there's armies in each one of these cities. Verse 12, nope, verse 13, and from all their territories, the priests and the Levites who were in all of Israel took their stand with him. Now notice this, the Levites, the Levites who were up north, you remember the Levitical cities and they're scattered throughout all of the 12 tribes? The Levites are leaving their Levitical cities and coming to Jerusalem, coming down south because that's where their ministry is. This is the God I serve. This is the God that gave me a position and a place and this is who I'm gonna go. For the Levites left their common lands and their possessions and came to Judah and Jerusalem. For Jeroboam, the son of Nebat, had rejected them from serving as priests to the Lord. Then he appointed for himself priests for the high places and for the demons and for the calf idols which he had made. Why are the Levites leaving? Because Jeroboam would not honor their position as priests. What it doesn't tell us here in Chronicles is Jeroboam realizes that at the mandatory feast, at least three times a year, all of his people are going to go to Jerusalem, right? And they might like Rehoboam. They might like his kingdom better. They might like his God better. Well, I, he's jealous, you know. I can't have all my people running down there, you know. So we've got to keep the people here. So he sets up the golden calves. He's going to set one up at Bethel, which is, which is right outside of Jerusalem. It's 18 miles, you know, outside of Jerusalem on the pathway that you've got to take to get to Jerusalem. So he's going to set a golden calf up at Bethel, and he's going to set one up at Dan, way up in the north. So north and south, whether my people try to leave the country to go worship something, we'll capture them right there. They can worship at our place. Remember, Jeroboam had just returned from Egypt. For years, he'd been in Egypt. What did he worship in Egypt? What's all over in Egypt? Oh, the cows. The goat gods, you know, here he is. He, he tells these people, these are thy gods, O Israel, that brought you up out of Egypt. He tells them that in, in, second, or in Kings, you know. And he institutes his own personal priesthood line. And he starts with his sons, and then it says, and he, he also brings in the most base of men. That's a great way to put it. Any fool that wants a job, you know, he'll bring in. Remember, God had told him, if you will walk with me and if you will obey me, I will make your kingdom like David's kingdom and I will make you a king like David. And Jeroboam throws all of that out the window in the biggest bonehead move you can probably read about, you know, in the Old Testament. So God's priests who live in those cities, the Levitical cities, they all start moving south. Whoever writes this book, notice in verse 15, but whoever writes this book, and we believe it's Ezra, and Ezra wrote it as they're coming back from the captivity, Babylonian captivity. And they're coming back, and he says, Jeroboam makes his own priests for the high places and for the demons 
and for the golden calves. The demons is the word for the he-goat, you know? It's the worship of Pan or the goat god or the satyr, you know, up in Dan. Um, when we were in Israel, up in Dan, there is the oldest mud gate ever found. And here's this 4,000 plus year old mud gate um, outside the city of Dan. And to stand there, you know that Abraham stood at this gate when, when the five kings stole his nephew, Lot, and went north, he chased them to Dan, and then he moves on from there and he goes to uh, up past Damascus. But, but, you know, Abraham would have cried out over this gate, hey, is my nephew Lot, you know, in the city. Um, They've excavated inside of that city. Brenda and I were there, and, and here's this high place. Here's this place where the golden calf would have been. Um, the other thing, you know, up north in uh, Caesarea Philippi, they worship the goat god. And so they have, there's this big rock face with a big cave in the bottom of it, and they, they would call that the abyss, the, the cave to the abuso. And, and then they had the, the goat gods, and they have the goat um, graveyard right up top of it, you know. And there's still some graves there with apparently goat bodies in them, I don't know. But they're, they're little god places, but uh, just all of that stuff going on while Israel's in the land, you know. Verse 16, uh, I've lost myself. Now, when all of Israel saw that the king did not listen to them, oh, sorry, wrong chapter. And after the Levites left those from all the tribes of Israel, such as set their heart to seek the Lord God of Israel, came to Jerusalem to sacrifice to the Lord their God and their fathers. So they strengthened the kingdom of Judah. I'm just going to stop there for a minute. It says, not only did the priests and the Levites leave and come back, but all those who had a heart to seek the Lord, to worship the Lord. It's interesting. God always has a remnant. No matter what's going on in the culture, what's going on in the land, what's going on wherever, God always has a people. But imagine the price these guys are paying because their inheritance is in the land and they have to leave their land. They have to leave mom and dad. They have to leave their houses and their families and their land and their graves of their ancestors. They leave all of that behind and come to worship Jehovah God. These are willingly defecting from the north because they want God that badly. That's, that's an amazing idea, you know? And it says, So they strengthened the kingdom of Judah and made Rehoboam the son of Solomon strong for three years because they walked in the way of David and Solomon for three years. Not stronger just because the numbers came, but because men of faith are coming men who believe in the God of the Bible. They're willing to sacrifice to their God. They're willing to sacrifice for their God. They're willing to walk away from the things of the world for him. And that brings strength to any group, you know. This group who the, thinks the Lord is more important than all the worldly stuff they could ever have. And he is, right? He's more important than their families. He's more important than their traditions or their burial places, you know. The word of God and his worship is more important to me than all of that. And they made Rehoboam strong, and sadly it says, for three years. Rehoboam's going to reign for 17 years. But for three of those years... Hey, they got their act together. They were walking in the ways of David, Solomon. They were, they were doing okay stuff. Verse 18, Then Rehoboam took for himself as wife, uh, whatever her name is, Mahathala, the daughter of Jeremoth, the son of David, and of Abihel, the daughter of Elah, 
the son of Jesse. So it appears to be one of David's concubines, not a legitimate wife, you know. So she's never mentioned in, the, in all the, the places in the Bible that he had this daughter. Abihel, the daughter, it, the word used for daughter is also the word used for granddaughter. It appears to be David's granddaughter that he takes. A daughter would have been, you know, a generation older than Rehoboam. So, you know, probably not marrying some older woman. Don't know. So anyway, verse 19. And she bore him children, Jishash, Shemahiah, and Zechariah. <laughs> yeah, good luck. And after her, he took Micaiah, the granddaughter of Absalom, and she bore him Abijah, Atta, Ziza, and Shilamah, Shilamith. Now Rehoboam loved Micaiah, the granddaughter of Absalom, more than all of his wives and his concubines, for he took 18 wives and 60 concubines and begot 28 sons and 60 daughters. Can you imagine just going to the grocery store for beauty makeup stuff for these girls. I mean, 18 wives, you know, 60 daughters, 60. I mean, you would just flat stick to the floor in the bathroom in this house, you know. There'd be so much hairspray going on there. But Now, He's not as bad as his dad was. His dad, 700 wives, 300 concubines. You know, he just has 18 wives and 60 concubines, you know. But he has a favorite. Oh, here's, here's a recipe for intrigue, right? For trouble. It's all right to have a favorite if you only have one wife. And that's all we should ever have, right? and she should be your favorite girl on the planet, right? <laughs> but is it okay to have a favorite if you have 18 wives? I don't think so, you know? Says in 22, uh, where'd I get to? Gotta get right. To and Rehoboam appointed Ahijah, the son of Micaiah, as chief to be leader among his brethren, for he intended to make him king. And he dealt wisely and dispersed some of his sons throughout all the territories of Judah and Benjamin to, to every fortified city, and he gave them provisions in abundance. He also sought many wives, and notice the for them is in italics, not really in there. He does this one wise thing. The Holy Spirit inserts this scripture in here and he says he disperses some of his sons around the kingdom right you you've got one boy and you want to favor him and you want to make him king all the other boys start looking and go if we knock him off then we could you know we might have the chance so he disperses them and the holy spirit says that was a wise thing to do <laughs> like that because all the others may want to you know turn their heart against him but what was not wise was he still desires a multitude of wives. Hmm. He still wants more. Oh, he loves the one, but he wants more. Can you love one and still want more? And the Holy Spirit indicates that's not the wisest choice. So, in chapter 12, it says, Now it came to pass when Rehoboam had established the kingdom and had strengthened himself that he forsook the law of the Lord and all Israel along with him. He comes to the throne. He, he thinks he knows best. You know, dad's old crew doesn't know what they're talking about. His advice, you know, those old peers, who, who cares? So I'm going to ask my buddies, you know, all the guys I, I used to party and drink with and the spoiled ones. And, and he ends up dividing the kingdom. Then he gets incensed about that they would leave him like that. And so he wants to go to the war and kill him. God has to intervene. Then he fortifies all the cities around Jerusalem. And for three years, he's walking with the Lord, watching people who truly believe come down south 
to hang out with the Lord and to worship him there. And then he turns away from the law of the Lord. And that is always the first step. That is always what the cults want you to do. Oh, forget about that word of God. We've got the real word of God over here. Turn away from that. Come to us. Turning away from the written word, the revealed word of God, is a fatal step. <laughs> Can be a fatal step. And once you make that move, it always leads you to idolatry. Some other God. And notice this. All of Israel follows him. It says in verse 2, And it happened in the fifth year of King Rehoboam that Shishak, king of Egypt, came up against Jerusalem because they had transgressed against the Lord. Why is Shishak here? Because they have turned away. They've transgressed against the Lord. This Egyptian king, Shishak, is, certain, is simply a chastening rod in the hand of God. God says, I need to get his attention. I need to turn him back, you know. Whenever we rebel against the Lord, we're bound to run across a Shishak in our place, in our path, you know, wherever we're going. When you decide to rebel, when, when you do something in your own way, when you're not really willing to submit your life to the revealed will of God, put out the welcome mat, she shacks on his way. Hebrews chapter 12, verse 6. For whom the Lord loves, he chastens. And he scourges every son whom he receives. If you endure chastening, God deals with you as sons. For what son is there who a father does not chasten? But if you are without chastening, of which all have become partakers, then you are illegitimate and not sons at all. Furthermore, we have had human fathers who corrected us, and we paid them respect. Shall we not much more readily be in subjection to the Father of spirits and live? You know, it's interesting, in excavations in Egypt, down near uh, Karnak, Egypt, on the southwest wall of this palace that they've dug up are written the names of these cities that Rehoboam fortified, and they're all conquered by Shishak. All of them, you know? Yes, some of them have been defaced and you can't read them, but there's enough of them there that you know, you know what's going on there. And then it says in verse 3, he comes with 1,200 chariots, 60,000 horsemen, people without number who came with him out of Egypt. The Lubium and the Skukim and the Ethiopians, you know. He comes with 1,200 battle tanks, if you will. That was their battle tank of the day. 60,000 horsemen, that's a lot. And the regular army with out number. <laughs> Those all come out of Egypt. And he's got the Lubin with him, which is the people from Libya today. The Skookums, you know, I don't know what Skookums is, but the, the, the idea is they were cave dwellers. I don't know where they lived. Uh, they, they were probably spooky people, I don't know. And the Ethiopians. And it says in verse 4, And he took the fortified cities of Judah and came to Jerusalem. He takes these fortified ones, the ones that have the food and the, the armies in them and the, the armed forces and all the weapons and all of that. He comes in and he takes those. The exceedingly strong cities, yeah, he just walks through them. <laughs> always reminds me of those doomsday preppers. You ever watch that show? You ever see them? Here's these guys, you know, and they want to live off the grid, and they want to live out in the middle of nowhere, and they've got their gold and their guns and their girls, and they got these fortresses that they've tried to build up, and, and no matter what happens in the future, we're going to be okay. We can handle everything that comes. Well, they're not expecting the Lord to return because I got news for you. None of that stuff works against the Lord's stuff. When the Lord moves, he can move all of that stuff out of your way. <laughs> yeah. 
it's, it's interesting to me. You have no security without the Lord. I don't care how much you prep. The place Rehoboam and the place we need to be fortifying is our relationship with the Lord. That's the fortification that needs build up. If that thing was strong, you know, if there was some fire and life and, and love in that relationship, you know. But you look around our world today, so many in fear because of the shishaks, the skookums coming in, you know. We've got all of this stuff coming in. So much of our trouble you know, is it from the Lord? Is it a chastening hand upon a rebellious people? Well, let me ask you, are we a rebellious people? Have we walked away from him? Have we turned our back? We're going to do this our way. We're more interested in our prosperity and what we want and all of this stuff. We're not really interested in you, you know. Our world is changing every day. Have you noticed I'm not saying it's changing for the better. I'm just saying it's changing, you know. We're seeing so many things happening right now. So many things that could be tied to the end times. I mean, this COVID thing. It's doing such a crazy work in the world, let alone in America. You know, the cashless society. We just assume you not bring cash because it carries germs and it carries... So if you could pay with a card... You know, or if you could just tap the card onto the little thing so nothing has to touch your exchange, that'd be, that'd be amazing. Isn't it funny how a cashless society, we can see it now, right? It's right there. The, the ability to buy and sell or not be able to buy and sell without a mark. You can't come in without a mask. I'm not against masks. I'm not pro-mask. I'm not anti-mask. I just, I'm not scared. I don't care. But, you know, you know who's enforcing that? The people. The people are enforcing it. Hey, there's a rule. You can't come in here without that. That's how it's going to be with the mark of the beast. That guy doesn't have a mark. He can't come in here. He can't do this. We see a world government actually beginning to flex its muscle a little bit. You know, a one world system. It's becoming visible. All of that making the way for an antichrist. Think about this. A guy is going to come on the scene and have all the answers. He's going to be Mr. Smooth. And he's going to have an answer for this, an answer for racism, an answer for that, an answer for this. This is what we've got to do. And who do you think is going to jump on that bandwagon? Everybody is going to jump on his banner. Man, we need that guy. We need to do what he says. Hmm. Now, it's interesting. In the end times, we Christians were encouraged to strengthen the things that remain, the things that can't be shaken. You know, in, in Revelation, we're told to uh, remember from where we have fallen, repent and do the first works, you know. Get back to your roots. Get back to that first love. We are living in days of a paradigm shift. Did you ever think you would see this in America? What's going on? Do you ever? And yet, we're living in that time. God put you down here right now so you could walk through this time. You, at this time, in this place, right? On purpose. Do you know Jesus? As the, as the song we sang, are you trusting him? Has he got you? You know, if it's my turn to go home, it's my turn to go home, let's go. But if it's not, Lord, let me make a difference down here until you come, you know? Have you come to accept his finished work on your behalf, the work of the cross? where he takes and pays for sin. Not sins, plural. He, he pays for sin. He did not come down here to condemn. No, he came down here to save and to forgive. To bring us to the Father. 
tonight before more chastening comes upon this nation or upon this Christ-rejecting world, would you set your future in order? Would you make sure it's locked in? And there's only, well, there's two ways to lock that in. There's, there's really only one way to lock that in, and that is to accept Christ as your Lord and Savior. Accept that eternal life that He freely and undeservedly is offering you. Come to Him by faith. And then go home and be wise about how you live, what you do with your possessions, with your family. Fortify your relationship with the Lord. I see the return of Christ very near. I could be wrong. You know, I thought he was coming back in the 90s when I got saved. I could swear uh, we only had a couple of years left back then. You know? But uh, apparently I was wrong. Imagine that. I believe it's very close. And his advice to you and to me and to the believers around the world, John 14, 1, let not your hearts be troubled. You believe in God, also believe in me. In my Father's house are many mansions. If it would not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go to prepare a place for you, I will come and receive you to myself, that where I am, you will also be. Boy, don't let your heart become troubled. Trouble's going on all around us. Don't let it penetrate in here. Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly. Let the Spirit of the Lord, you know, abound in you. And then the other place you're supposed to run, you know, Luke 21. Now, when you see these things begin to take place, what are we supposed to do? <laughs> Look up, lift up your heads, for your redemption draws nigh. All right? Is your head down tonight? Are you scared? Are you lonely? Are you overwhelmed by all the stuff that's going on in the world? You know what you're supposed to do? Seek the Lord. Pray. Look up. Look up. Get your eyes off the world. Get your eyes off this planet. Get your eyes off your circumstances. Look up. You know? Break out of that funk and break into the presence of the Lord. Hmm. May the Lord bless you and keep you this week. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen.